So uh, let me just open with how much I'm glad we prayed for the Holy Spirit at the beginning. That is our greatest need, right? We need the Holy Spirit's presence. We need God's power. That's our that's our greatest need. Ellen White says that. And uh, so we want to begin by talking about God's desire for His church. What is God's vision for His work? Where does what does God want for His people? What is God's ambition, passion for the work of God? For his, for his, uh, for his people, and uh, there is a, a wonderful statement. You have read this statement before. It's from Great Controversy, page four sixty four. Before Jesus comes, there will be a revival of deep spiritual passion. Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth. There will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. There must be earnest effort. It is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions. And so this revival will, pray, will entail, number one, pray for the, the descent of the Holy Spirit. We should pray as earnestly for the descent of the Holy Spirit as the disciples prayed on the day of Pentecost. So why do we have to pray so earnestly for the descent of the Holy Spirit? What do you think? about that on this little word this I love the music this morning. Thank you for that. And why should we why is why does the Lord give us this admonishment to pray earnestly for the descent of the Holy Spirit? We can't do it. We can't it. He brings power. Okay. What else does he bring? Yes. It's a deep good grand controversy in the Okay, so we need discernment to keep from being misled. He leads others to our path. He does. He leads others to our path. That's a beautiful statement. Your name? Jennifer. Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. I met Jennifer. I met Sherry. I met Dallas. Where's Dallas? Back there. I met Eric from the back, right? Eric. I said, uh, I know I know some of your names already. Um, and and Zillion, I thought I was right, but I wanted to make sure. Zillia, who's from Florida. Uh, which makes me feel a little bit at home. Uh, <laughs> that you accept the word of people. <laughs> so, uh, so we, so it's really a great gift. And and, and let, look, look at this statement: the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the church is looked forward to as in the new future. But it is the privilege of the church to have it now. Seek for it, pray for it, believe for it. We must have it, and heaven is waiting to bestow it. So we don't have to wait, right? We don't have to wait for the descent of the Holy Spirit. We can have it now. Boy, that's a great thing. And the Lord tells us that when we pray for it, He will come. So we pray this morning for the descent of the Holy Spirit, among other needs that we have. And God has already been answering that prayer. And I felt his presence here this morning as we pray. Humbling, so number one, we must pray for it. These are the conditions of revival. Number two, 
We must humble our hearts in repentance. It is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us his blessing. So why does God call us to, to humble ourselves, uh, our hearts, in repentance? Why does the Lord say that? Demonstrate our need for him. Demonstrate our need for him. Your name? Chris. 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 Demonstrate, Demonstrate our need for him. Okay, good. What else? So come to the end of ourselves. We can't get there by our own means. What does it mean to come to the end of yourself? That's a really great statement. <laughs> Give up our own way. Yes. Give up our own way. Surrender. Surrender. <laughs> Surrender. <laughs> Lose any pride, Sherry. Thank you. So let go of our own desire to be great or to be in charge or be strong or to be prominent. What else? What else? Why does God say humble ourselves? Pray for repentance. Lean not unto your own understanding. Boy, that is a great problem. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. We working to And all your ways acknowledge. How do you acknowledge? How do you get to know what this way is going? What's your name? How do you get to know the ways of the Holy Spirit? The ways of God. Hey, listen to me in your presence. Right? Study. Study, boy. Listen to your here. The Word of God. What else? Having a conversation with Him. Having a conversation with Him. Where you talk to him and then you kind of to listen to him. Let, let his, his spirit, spirit, spirit sink in your heart. That takes time. That it does. It takes it takes peace. Yeah, that's beautiful. beautiful. Somebody else, else. How, how do you listen to him? How do you learn to listen to him? Act Act all. I love it. Your name again? Yeah. 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 Your last name? I know, I know you are. And that's what I was trying to get across. 
God likes you as well as he loves you. Now, you may not always feel worthy, and you may not feel worthy. That we uh, all sin come short. We, we know that. But to know that God likes us and wants to, so when you like people, what do you like to do? You want a relationship? Yes, you want to spend time with them. You want you want to be around them, right? So you want to feel their presence. So yesterday morning. I uh, had to stop her one day, and then I had to. I got home, and then I, my wife and I went to breakfast. We don't often do that, but we did spend more time with her rather than just grabbing something in the kitchen for this party. Today, because I was going to be home, I get home tomorrow night late, but I'm spending about the night at the airport because I have to leave early the next morning to go to Washington D.C. To be with a school uh, up there, it's a college up there. So the um, so I won't see her till late Tuesday. But the the thing is, you know, when you like somebody, you want to be around them. You like you just like to spend time with them. God likes to spend time with you and me. He likes to feel our presence. He likes to know us. He likes our hearts to be still around him. He likes to sense um, what we're about. Now, he already knows. He knows everything about us, everything. But he likes that lingering experience. It's a sweet thing. So getting back to the grandchildren. So I have these two that are younger, and I have these two that are teenagers. Teenagers are trickier. Although they love me and Grandma and all of us, and, but they're busy. They got school, and they got their friends, and the one that's 17 going to be 18 for long, I mean, she's, she's ready to move on. I mean, she's, she's done with that dumb high school stuff, and she is ready and, and she doesn't want her grandfather treating her like a baby anymore. She doesn't want it. The six-year-old and the nine-year-old, now they live in a different place. They, they're they okay with me treating them a little bit like a baby, even though they can't take too much of it. But, but, they, but there is something about sitting on the couch watching Bluey with them. That's a, Chris, that's a kid's show, Bluey. There's something, I don't like it, but they like it. There is something about sitting on the couch with them that just feels right because I'm in their presence. God wants to soak in our presence with us. He, he, God has this element about him. That's where we get, as humans, our love for being around people we love. That's the image of God. So... Then he asks us to repent, and I think one of the reasons is he wants to take something out of the way in our life. What is it we need to get rid of? Huh? Sin? Yeah. Pride. Thank you. Your name? JC. Okay. Pride. Okay. Sin. What else? Selfishness. Oh, that is so hard, isn't it? Now, you don't know selfishness until God convicts you of it a lot of times. I mean, it takes time with God, and it takes maturity, you know, growing. That's why I said I'm still growing in God in, by his grace. It is because it takes time to be convicted of our selfishness and our own ways that we're putting a roadblock in, Right? So one of the things that we put away is dissension. That's one of the things that Ellen White says about the Holy Spirit being poured out. Let Christians put away all dissension and give themselves to God for the saving of the lost. So one of the things we have to repent of is our dissension. When we don't like other people and the way they have done things. Now this is big. This is big, 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 big. Because we 
do that with people. I mean, somebody in the grocery store bumps into us or is rude or whatever. I mean, you know, when you're driving or something. Or a neighbor is a little selfish or thoughtless or whatever. We get it. We got to put that away. But there are times when we have been hurt by people. Now, if you're a human, you have been hurt at some time. I mean, I'm talking about your whole life, you know. You look at, you look back, and your whole life, from the time you were a little person, a little, little person, to the time today, that's a, some of us, that's a long time, a longer time. There are times when we have been hurt, and there, and that hurt affects us and leaves sore spots. So y'all, you folks are, you know, you, you, you're more in the outdoor type environment by your nature because you live in this wonderful part of the United States. I mean, you live in one of the most wonderful places in all the United States. But when you're outdoor folks, you're hiking or you are doing cutting wood or you are doing this or that or chores or whatever your life may encounter, you will sometimes get a blister or you will get a, uh, uh, a thorn or something in you, uh, your hand or something. And that kind of stuff leaves an impact. And then as time, a day or so goes by, you need to get that out, right? If you have a little thorn. And that creates a festering if it's very deep or it doesn't get out and it's still sensitive. So you have to get that little thorn out. This is what hurt does over time. From the time you were a kid all the way to the time when you were a bigger kid and you were a teenager and when you were a young adult and when you were raising your kids in middle age, so to speak, sort of, whatever that is defined as. And then as you get older, too, you get hurt. You don't get through the world without getting hurt. Have you noticed that? <laughs> and you get you get bruised. And those things take time to get rid of. And some of that doesn't go away very easily because it's deep. You get it? Now, maybe this doesn't happen in Montana. It may only happen in Florida. I understand. It may only happen in Florida. But it gets, you know, you get, it gets deep. And then you have to address it or else it festers inside your soul. Does that make any sense to you? Maybe it only happens in Florida. But I think it may happen everywhere. And so, you know I'm being silly. And then that's, we won't go too deep on it right this moment, but let me just put a little thing in. That's where, in order to get rid of dissension, you got to use, you got to pick that briar out. You know, you may have to cut a little bit or you may have to dig around and you may have to put some ointment on it. And that is called forgiveness. Forgiving people who've hurt and been mean or cruel or thoughtless or selfish or whatever. So one of the conditions of the church, this is where it's getting a little deeper now. <laughs> Talking about grandkids and everything, having fun. Well, this is where it's getting a little deeper. When you get, when, when one of the conditions of receiving the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that you get rid of dissension. That means dealing with hurts and forgiving people. Now that is really a little deeper right there, you know, because forgiveness is a big thing. 
I mean, it is big, right? We won't go too deep on that right this minute. But I just want to leave it. That forgiveness is an experience that makes a world of difference in the life of the person that's forgiving, doing the forgiving. A world of difference. A world of difference. So I, I read a book the last, this last week. And it was a, you know, it's a book I had no business with. It was a book on um, psychology, and it was on uh, family, on on children's child. It was it was by psychotherapists, and it wasn't a by them. It was written as an overview of these all these theories, you know, about child development and all this stuff. The thing that I got, one of the things I got out of it, now I'm just a dumb preacher, you know, what am I reading a book like that? The, um, is because th there are wounds that when a kid gets a wound, it happens for older people too, there's something about that that they take a little responsibility for psychologically and it creates an infection, and it identif they bec it becomes part of the identity of the human, you know, part of the identity. So when your identity is brought is kind of caught up with that wounding, then you forgiveness is the only way to release it. Does that make any sense? And uh, so that's really powerful. And that's where I am this year in 23. That's where God has got me in 23. I'll tell you more about it sometime. So then look at, well, look at number four. This is about conditions for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it is not an individual thing. When God is talking through this Ellen White, these Ellen White uh, Council, uh, Spirit of Prophecy quotations, it isn't just you he, she's talking to you as a person, but she's also talking to you as the people of God, plural, see? And so often what we read about is things we take in because Americans are really independent, individualistic. I was, uh, I was teaching a class in Brazil a few years ago, it was for leaders in the division office and the union presidents and other officers. I'm not too impressed with that kind of administrative stuff. I just want you to know. I'm not against them. I love them. But I'm not impressed with conference presidents. I'm not impressed with general conference people, union people. I'm not, impre I'm not impressed with all those kind of folks. The reason was is I was one of them for 25 years, and so I'm not impressed with those guys. But the uh, but but the point is that um, when I was teaching this class in Brazil, and, the, and there were people there from Argentina and Peru and all the rest of the places, I was amazed at how individualistic they think of Americans. You know. They don't comprehend how much freedom means to our mindset. They, they, they I mean, they, they understand the, you know, democracy and all that, and the value it, and religious freedom and all that, of course. But they don't understand why Americans get on our high horse about being imposed upon. It doesn't work. I mean, it does. They're more about community or about about the uh, the group and even though they may not have get things their way they they can live with it if everybody if most of the people like it a certain way but we are much more than all the other nation nationalities i realize this we are much more individualistic and independent and so when we read Ellen White about the church, we take it inside, but it's also 
there's an application for us as a body, as a group, you know, that I don't think I get. It was in the Sabbath school lesson for this week. Ephesians 6, uh, 10 to 20 or something, verses 10 to 20. It was about, it talked about how that armor of God thing is not just for you and me individually in spiritual warfare. It's about us as a church, as a, as a body, as a group. All of you put on the armor. That's really what it was saying too. Well, that's just kind of interesting to me. And that Ellen White is telling us that all of you need to put away dissension. That's an individual heart thing. But it also is part of the family. It's about a family thing. And then we, the fourth thing, and this is the hard one, we got to give ourselves to the saving of the lost. Oh, shucks. I thought it was about revival. I thought it was about spiritual life. And here, lo and behold, it's about involvement, giving ourselves to the saving of the lost. It's about... It's about caring for other people outside of us. Now, that doesn't hurt you. you are, I'm, I'm lonely being facetious because you folks care about people. I know you do. But involvement in mission is one of the conditions of being, uh, of receiving the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So it's not only our personal preparation, but it's also about engagement. What do you think about that? I've been talking a lot. I've been talking and talking. I don't usually try to do that because I try to use questions. But um, what do you think about that? What comes to mind? What do you not like about what I said? Or what do you like? Well, in order for people to have a true revival, they have to become outwardly focused. Yes. Right. Yep. You get caught up and you have to always keep your vision on the whole world. Amen. Katie, you want to preach today? I mean, I think you could preach for church if you want to. Well, that was good. That was great. That was one of the best sermons I've heard in a long time. Thank you. What else? What else do you what else did you picked up from this? <laughs> Chris. Yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't do what we need to do without going out. Yeah, you've got to have a focus on the outside, right? Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Wonderful. What do the rest of you think? What's the challenge for churches to be focused on the outside? What do you think? Leadership. Leadership. Okay, say more about that, Chris. Well, I mean, like, some, I'm fairly new coming into our church. Okay. A couple of years ago. All right. I would like to do that stuff, but I have no idea how to do it, how to go about doing it. I don't right. have that kind of... I, you don't know how, right? How to, what, where to start? Right. And so, I mean, that's... That's normal. I feel like that's what, I mean, I feel like that's what we're doing. That's why I'm here. That's yeah. Why I want to Praise God. Amen. Yeah, that's right. Yep, me too. I love it too. That's great. It's good to have that willingness too because oftentimes that's a barrier. Yeah, it is often a barrier. Yeah. Yes, JC, is that what? Yeah. We've got to be careful. We don't save the lost. Okay. We are just part of the conduit for God. Amen. Yep. So it's, so we are the conduit. God is the one. It's the Spirit that works. Amen. That's so good. Cherry. Yep. Yeah. That, yeah. So it's a revival, really, to get that kind of flipped around, right? Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Now, you must be friends with Sherry at least. What is your name? Terry. Terry. Sherry and Terry. Well, that's pretty easy. Thank you. Okay. 
What do the rest of you think? It starts with our neighbors. Starts with our neighbors. It starts with people that we know or that we run into in our day-to-day -day life. Yeah, Arlene, thank you. Thank you. Right. To reach, to, to be involved in mission is generally most effective as a group effort. Yeah. Not on your own. And it has yep. to work cohesively together to have to set aside the differences. Yeah. Problems. You do. And you know, I love how you just caught that idea that the, the involvement in mission is a command to the whole church. So all of us don't have to do the same thing, right? I mean, we don't have to see the. Doesn't, everybody doesn't have to get a Bible and a and a some lessons and go door to door. I mean, some may do that, and that's wonderful. But everybody doesn't have to do the same thing. But the church itself needs to come together and be involved in mission, and we can do something, right? And so that becomes more fun. Because Arlene may be good at something that Chris is not as good at, and Lloyd may be good at something that Eric is not as good at, and Dallas may be, you know, the whole thing goes on and on like that. I, and I love that. Boy, I tell you. So this is, so here the whole thing is the church is a family, right? It's a family. And the family has different roles. My wife does things differently she does things better than I do by nature and I do some things more naturally than she I mean it so we all have our different gifts our strengths and our uh, contributions so now what's another condition of the Holy Spirit I'm going to give you a break at 10 of which is only nine minutes so don't uh, give up unreserved surrender is the is the next requirement for the Holy Spirit that I want to mention. Uh, God will accept nothing less than unreserved surrender. So that means giving up even when we don't like to give up something we like, right? So this is where I'm going to get a little bit more tricky. Even sacrificing tradition for the sake of the gospel so in my church, this never happens in Montana, I know, but in my church in Sarasota, Florida, I, uh, you know, I love those good people there. Uh, I've been going to that church about five years or so. I've been a head elder for a time, for a year or two, and then I was, now I'm just an elder, and uh, which is what I wanted because I'm too busy to be able to be there as much as I would like. So, um, but the church, when I came, it was the greatest thing. I, I've been going to churches and preaching, you know, around Florida Conference, and I was in Pennsylvania Conference before that. So I was in a smaller conference, in a larger conference. And I would go to churches on Sabbath, and I would hang around, and we would I'd greet everybody. Then we'd have fellowship meal usually when I was a guest preacher. And then I'd wait around, and I would tell myself, some of our churches in Florida are uh, churches whose culture is not North American uh, principally, and we, they wouldn't get out to 1 o'clock or 1.30. And, uh, and they loved it. They loved that kind of uh, way of doing church. And so I would, you know, be there and greet people after church. We would, I might not start preaching till afternoon, after 12 sometime, or after <laughs> sometimes 5 to 1. So then I would go to fellowship meal, and, and I just kind of told myself, Mike, you're not getting in the car till 3 o'clock. You're not getting in the car till 3 o'clock. You're tired? It's okay. You're not getting in the car. Okay. And so I would wait. And and, the, and by that time, generally, the reason I said 3 o'clock is that a, a lot of the people had started to clear out, go home from meal from the meal. 
And there was like 20, 30% of the people left. And I'd spoken to everybody I could. And then I would just go see the pastor, thank him for the invitation. And, you know, then I could go, I could go home without him feeling like I rushed off. Well, I didn't mind that at all. But when I retired and started going to the Sarasota Church every Sabbath, that was the greatest thing that I'd ever seen in all of my life. I was 65 when I started going to the church, 65 or so. And um, I wasn't quite retired yet, but uh, I was one of the youngest people there. I mean, it was wonderful. I was, you know, I felt I felt taller. I felt more strong. And st I mean, I'd go there, and these people, you know, are older than me. And, and then when they asked me to be an elder, I thought, whew. They are trusting the next generation. I mean, <laughs> this was amazing. And so, you know, we would go to church there, and uh, I'd sit there, you know, kind of like one of the youth group and my wife. And then uh, by nine minutes after 12, we had said amen. I had shaken the hand of the pastor. I had walked out to my car after saying hello to a few folks, and I was starting that engine, and I was rolling out of the parking lot. Ten after 12, I was on the road going home. Man, it was the greatest thing in all the world. I almost went to sleep during church. That was the other side. But, man, I was going home. I felt like, oh, my, I'm home by 1230. I mean, I'm at my house. I have the, I get to eat my food. I don't have to eat a casserole. It was the greatest thing. It was wonderful. Well, you know, the church has changed by the grace of God. Now we got younger people in the church, and now we go longer sometimes. And you know, and it, we have to sit around and talk and stuff. And I'm just kidding about it. You know, I'm kidding. But the point is, is that. We had a sister who had been in charge of the organ forever. I mean, she played the organ right after Noah's got off the ark. They, they brought that ark out, I mean, that, that organ out right after the flood. And she's been playing it ever since. I mean, she's, she's good at it, too. I mean, you know, 85 or so, and she's playing really well, and... And wonderful, and leads the choir. Everybody in the choir is 70 or older, so you got to. I wasn't quite old enough to be in the choir at first, but now I'm in the choir. But the, um, but the thing about it is, is that we started bringing in some younger people. We had a younger young pastor. We got a new pastor, and they sent us a 37 year old. I mean, all of all the things. They sent us this young man and his wife and family. So anyway, and then we start doing, trying to make everybody involved, not just the old people, because they brought me in, for one. That started it. And then, and then they started letting people in their 20s and 30s. I mean, it was amazing. It was, you know, why they would do that, I don't know. But the church has changed, and it's been hard for, the, for my friends that are that older crowd, like my parents' age. It is harder for them to let go of tradition in order to have everybody involved. But that's part of what life in church is, right? Sacrificing our own desires for the sake of making a kingdom impact. Well, okay, it's three minutes till 10, and I've been talking, and it is time for us to take a break. So what if we... Take a break now till ten to eleven o'clock. Uh, how does that sound? Is it ten forty seven? Ten forty seven. So what if we go to eleven? Right, that gives us thirteen minutes. Take a little break. Okay, thank you.